We've seen time and time again in this war how the terror bombing of civilians by all sides has little to no effect on the actual war, except perhaps strengthening the morale of the people in the nation being targeted. That enraged public has been placated by politicians promising revenge and counterfactual statements about how this time vengeance will win the war. Stalin failed to bomb the Finns into submission and revenge for not bowing to Soviet supremacy. Hitler failed to bomb the British out of the war when he realized that he wouldn't win an invasion. During the first British revenge campaign for that blitz, Churchill himself repeatedly concluded that it was a wasteful, deadly failure. And yet, the Allies tried again and are still trying, reaching the same goals. And now, predictably, the German enemy response is revenge. Vergeltung, when Hitler launches the next step in this tit-for-tat waste of human life. Will his V-1 drones finally have the promised effect? This is War Against Humanity, a series of World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olsen. Over the past year, Germany has been bombarded from the air, pushed back in all theaters, and is now caught in a giant pincer from east and west. With every setback, the Nazis have become even more obsessed with finding some way to win by murder. They truly believe that exterminating Europe's Jewish population is a strike against the Allied coalition. They think that retaliating against random civilians in occupied lands will dissuade resistance and opposition. Hitler also believes that striking against British civilians will break the Allied will to wage war. Over the past year, Hitler's public broadcasts, though few and far between, have consistently hinted at some form of massive retaliation aimed at the British. During his speech on November 8, 43, to mark the 20th anniversary of the Beer Hall Putsch, Hitler promised vengeance. The hour of retribution will come. If we cannot reach America at the moment, one state is within our reach. Thank God. And we will hold on to it. The Luftwaffe failed to make good on this promise during Operation Steinbock, the opening raids of which I covered back in March. The offensive only killed 1,500 British civilians, while the German attackers lost over 300 aircraft, further dwindling their force of pilots and air crews. Steinbock also failed to inflict terror in British hearts. Diary entries show that after an initial shock, the British were largely unconcerned about the bombing. They were more interested in when and where the Second Front in Europe would open. At home in Germany, the effect of the RAF campaign against German cities has been far more deadly, but that too has failed to break the German war spirit. If anything, it has strengthened the will to fight, with widespread calls for revenge. In fact, when you look at the accumulated data on the German population's response, the disappointment at the lack of revenge on the British is the prevalent sentiment. The Nazis, especially Hitler, are acutely aware of this public relations crisis, and that if it is not addressed, that will indeed deteriorate German morale. Hitler believes that if it is addressed, it is the key to victory, or as he summarized back in November 43. After all, whoever has already lost all his belongings can only have one desire, that the war will never be lost, since only a victorious war can help him get his things back. And so, the hundreds of thousands of bombed out are the vanguard of revenge. Hitler believes that by raining death on London, he will satisfy a population craving vengeance, unite the German people behind the war effort as never before, and carry the Reich to final victory. To reach that dream, his technocrats have promised him a wonder weapon, Wunderwaffe, for revenge, Vergeltung, the V-weapons. The V-1 pilotless flying bomb and the more advanced V-2 rocket. But armaments minister Albert Speer and Luftwaffe production chief Erhard Milch have both overpromised and underdelivered. Speer had said that the flying bombs would be ready for deployment by the beginning of April, with Milch speaking of bringing London to its knees by launching a salvo of 1,500 flying bombs on Hitler's birthday, April 20th. While that fails to materialize, the Nazi leaders continue to use them as rhetorical tools. Even though propaganda minister Josef Goebbels doubts the weapon's effectiveness, he tells an audience on June 4th in Nuremberg to expect new forms of retaliation that will soon have a decisive impact on the war. 
The very next day, June 5th, Hitler boasts that there will be 300 to 400 flying bombs launched daily at London within a few days. That turns out to be yet another of his fantasies. The first launches of flying bombs are nowhere near to that scale. In fact, there are yet more delays, and even though some 50 launch sites are prepared on the coast of Pas-de-Calais, it is almost another two weeks before the Luftwaffe begins Operation Eisbär, or Operation Polar Bear. When the first V-1 sites are catapulted into the sky at 2300 on June 12th, this first launch is a complete failure. Nine missiles are fired, none of which reach Britain. The second launch at 3.30 in the morning of June 13th is only slightly better. Ten flying bombs are launched, of these four crash on takeoff and two crash in the channel. Of the remaining four, only one bomb causes any serious damage when it smashes into a railway bridge in East London, blocking the lines in and out of London's Liverpool Street station. Six Londoners are killed. When Hitler hears of this, he is enraged that his new weapons have not taken more innocent lives. He even threatens to cancel the program. But after the Luftwaffe adjusts the launching procedure, the first large-scale launch of the weapons is more successful. On June 15th, beginning at 2300, over 240 flying bombs are launched over a 24-hour period. For the Londoners, being bombed is not a new experience. But the unpredictability of the V-1s causes a fair amount of alarm. The flying bombs can strike any time of day or night. Compared with the noisy, lumbering waves of Heinkels and Messerschmitts, the bombs almost seem to appear out of the blue. A young British diarist, Edward Stebbing, sums up the mood. I must admit that these things have put my nerves on edge more than ordinary raids. I suppose the novelty of them, the devilish ingenuity, has something to do with it. The first warning is the distinctive buzz of the engine, earning the new weapon the nicknames Buzz Bomb or Doodlebug after a noisy insect. In the opening days of the campaign, whole streets of people rush into the nearest public shelter at the sight or sound of a buzz bomb. At home, families huddle under protection of the Morrison or Anderson shelters, and they wait. They wait in fear that the sound of the engine stops, as Doris Robson, a young Londoner, explains. We realized that when the engine cut out, the unmanned plane would dip and fall to the ground. They fell anywhere and everywhere, and Hitler could not claim that he was trying to avoid killing innocent civilians. When you were at home and heard these things coming, your heart would be in your mouth, especially when the engine cut out. It would fall and explode, killing and maiming some poor devils, and we breathed a sigh of relief until the next one came our way. The V-1 may be a novel new threat, but calling it a technological marvel is a bit of a stretch. British examination of crashed missiles reveals cheap steel, rough workmanship, and poorly welded joints. The frequent crashes and testing and during operations are often caused by the pulse jet engine, which is a cheap and powerful power plant, but is primitive compared to later turbojet engines. The attrition rate of the bombs shows how shaky the technology is. Of the 240 V-1s launched on June 15th, about 100 crash after takeoff or before reaching Britain. Of those that do make it to the British shores, 30 are shot down by fighters or anti-aircraft guns, another 30 or so crash harmlessly, and 73, one-third, hit targets in London. But even a crude weapon like this can inflict huge devastation. The worst tragedy occurs in the opening days of the V-1 campaign. On Sunday, June 18th, hundreds of worshippers are packed into the guard's chapel attached to Wellington Barracks, next to St. James Park. The congregation is made up of servicemen and women, their relatives and other civilians. During the service, they hear the distinctive noise of an approaching buzz bomb. Suddenly, the engine cuts out. The silence that follows is quickly cut through by an awful rushing sound as the bomb hurtles earthwards. Mere seconds later, the bomb smashes into the church and explodes. The blast smashes open the concrete roof, which caves in and buries the congregation under ten feet of rubble. The rescue work lasts for two days, by which time 121 people are dead and 141 wounded. Among the dead is the commanding officer of the Grenadier Guards, Lord Edward Hay. The century-old church, which survived a near miss in the Blitz, is now completely destroyed. Only the altar and its silver cross remain standing. Six candles, miraculously untouched, continue burning throughout the devastation. 
By the end of the month, an average of about 50 V1s per day are landing in London. German propaganda wastes no time exploiting this new success. Apparently, great fires are raging in town centers all across the south of England from a constant rain of what Berlin calls Hitler bolts and dynamite meteors. Goebbels' propaganda newspaper, Das Reich, says that Germany has retaliated against D-Day by opening its own second front against the British. But in reality, like all the other campaigns so far, this wave of terror bombing neither advances the German war effort nor breaks the spirit of the British. After the initial shock, the British public soon get used to the buzzing, explosive doodlebugs. New networks of tracking and warning systems are put in place. To minimize production losses by false alarms, factories employ roof spotters instructed to sound the alert only when a V1 is on course for the factory itself. Once again, the perpetrating side fails to take note, or the disingenuous observer might say seizes on the public relations opportunity that they are really after. By July 17th, 152,000 people have been evacuated from London. German propaganda frames this as evidence that Britain is being brought to his knees. But to the contrary, the evacuations are part of a prepared response, as the Times newspaper reports. The smooth working of the scheme has been helped by the existence of plans drawn up last September in anticipation of some such attack as that of the flying bomb. Timetables were arranged and block allocations made for the first 100,000 evacuees. But although the flying bombs are crude and the government has had plenty of time to prepare, the V-1s have caught British air defenses somewhat off guard. Back in December 1943, the British had drawn up a plan codenamed Diver to defend against the V-1, but the anti-aircraft guns assigned to the plan were diverted from London to protect the invasion fleet massing for D-Day. So when Churchill ordered Diver into action on the morning of June 16th, it took some time to bring the guns back. But by the end of the month, there were almost 380 heavy guns, over 1,000 light guns, and 1,400 barrage balloons protecting London and nearby military installations. Even then, Diver isn't a perfect plan. Having anti-aircraft guns and fighters protecting the approaches towards London at the same time is inefficient. When the guns are firing, the fighters have to avoid the area and vice versa. Nonetheless, by mid-July, British defenses are shooting down a fair number of the bombs. Of the 4,000 flying bombs fired until then, 3,000 reached the air defense belt protecting London. 1,192 of these are taken down, 924 by fighters, 261 by guns, and 55 by balloons, and a few are duds or hit empty areas. So around 45% of launched drones reach their target. But the defenses will improve further. Right now, the anti-aircraft guns are being moved to the coast and equipped with new American radars which can track the V-1s earlier and more accurately. This move separates the artillery and aviation response, increasing the efficiency of both. The shells used are also said to be equipped with new American Variable Time or VT proximity fuses, which detonate as they approach the V-1. By the end of July, this combined defense will be taking down almost twice as many, about 60% of the flying bombs, so that less than 30% of the launches reach their target. The Allies are also trying hard to put the launching sites out of action, but the crossbow raids by the RAF and USAAF aren't proving all that effective. And by using their network of double agents, the British are also trying to confuse the Luftwaffe's targeting efforts. They hope that this will lead to more bombs landing in the sparsely populated countryside surrounding London. But despite the growing success of these countermeasures, an awful lot of bombs are still getting through, killing thousands of innocent civilians. For the month of July, 2,400 people are killed and 7,100 wounded. With the men away fighting or living in barracks, most of the adult victims of the V-1 are women. Some of the victims are barely old enough to understand the concept of warfare, like the 30 children who are killed when their children's home in Kent is smashed to pieces by a flying bomb on June 30th. And all these innocent lives are being destroyed for no justifiable reason at all. The Allies are secure on the continent, and the British are adapting to the new challenge posed by the V-1.
No matter how many civilians die, this campaign will not change Germany's dire prognosis, like the Blitz and Operation Steinbock before it, like the Allied bombing of German cities. The V1 proves once again that the targeting of civilians from the air is not the way to win a war. It only serves to deepen the Nazi regime's moral bankruptcy. And yet, as anyone in 2023 knows, this will not be the last time that a regime run out of military options vents its frustration on innocent men, women, and children in an indiscriminate campaign for murder from the sky. Never forget.